thus far, alhamdulillah, we've covered several topics, several of the diseases of the heart or spiritual diseases. Heart is another word. I don't want to get into that subject. It's, it's used very loosely nowadays. You hear that. It's a very popular term, right? Diseases of the heart. But one should first study what the heart means in, in Arabia to understand that. I'd rather say spiritual diseases because sometimes uh, an internal quwa. That's why I love Imam Ghazali's istalah and his terminology because quwa is a force. Inertia, you know. And it's internal, and it's metaphysical as opposed to physical. This is what he's talking about here. In, in, in terms of these qualities, he's talking about there are kowa, there is a power internally within man that is not physical, it is not part of the physical realm, it is metaphysical, like your will, right? Irada. Will is not something that you can tangibly see and quantify, yet we all possess it. This is something Allah has given us. This is a kowa. So we're talking about, if you want to put it in that, if you want to use that term, quwa, we're talking about forces within man that are either negative or positive. Diseases of the heart, it sounds so, anyhow, in this very, mashallah. So these are forces that are within us. And like inertia, they push you in a certain direction. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Innamal Indeed, our actions are only according to our attentions. Because this is the inertia that pushes you in a direction. And ultimately, that direction that you're traveling is your ultimate end. And that's what you will see in the Akhirah. But it's all based on what? The power within you that drove you there. That quwa within you that drove you there. What was your intention? What were you thinking? If you understand all of these issues in that in, in light of what I just said, then it's very easy to understand that these are problems, right, that lie within you. And you have to see, right, always when it comes to any of these issues, it's not always a matter of what you physically and tangibly can touch or quantify. Because we sometimes talk about things which can be quantified, like eating less, speaking less. Here, if you talk about hubba dunya and bukhul, these different qualities, right, loving the dunya and being greedy. So sometimes we feel as an individual or as a community or as a jama'ah group that we can quantify this. What do I mean by that? That if Falan drives a nice car or has a good career and happens to make more money than other people, then automatically this person loves the dunya. But that's not always the case. And because Falan looks like a zahid, what we call a person who abstains from the dunya, that mashallah, everything in their life is so simple. They don't even know how to match their uniform when they get up in the morning, right? Everything is so, so they don't care about anything in this dunya, right? It's mashallah, they're just mashy, mashy. Whatever happens, happens. So this person is a zahid. We can quantify it. Like that person does not love the dunya. Where the, the reality of hubba dunya is not something quantifiable. It's something internal. It's a force. It what drives that person to do what they do every day. That's why, again, I'm going to say this because, you know, we don't want anyone to get upset Right? But we have to be frank That Tazkiyat al-Nafs is not the place for us to massage our egos And tell ourselves that I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay It is the time to actually expose our faults in the sense of this That we want to know what our problems are Just as much as we want to know what our good qualities are Both have to be examined honestly Because otherwise, as I mentioned yesterday One will never so solve the problem until they know that it's there you won't solve the problem until you know it's there. So if that honest and frank talk offends you, I'm sorry. Right? But it has to be done. Even Imam Abu Hanifa, I think if you remember earlier when I started this talk, I mentioned how he categorized fiqh into three separate categories. And the middle category, what we're start, uh, st uh, talking about now, is al-fiqh al-awsat, which has to do with akhlaq, manners and morals. And you can even call it, you can go so far to say that this is a science of tazkiyat to nafs and there he defined fiqh as a whole whether it is your i'tiqad al-fiqh al-akbar your beliefs your creed well, whatever you want to call it or it's the middle tier al-fiqh al-awsat this is your mashallah your manners your ethics your morals or it's a fiqh al-asghar which is the do's and don'ts halal and haram right fadl and sunnah and so forth and so on he told us that the entire sum total of these three tiers equals what? Fiqh, what is it? 
is ma'rifat nafs ma laha wa ma alayha it is to know the nafs you as an individual because nafs again is a very difficult word to translate sometimes even in academia here in the west they translate the nafs as the soul because it's a, it, the nafs in essence is who you are in essence and according to who you speak to everyone will give it a different terminology so if the sophia speak about the nafs usually it's in a negative vein right they're talking about the lower self, meaning you as a person, when all you're interested in is self-benefit. And usually that self-benefit is only relegated to what is, again, the mundane affairs of this world. Eating, sleeping, procreating, and that's it. Usually when the Sophia talk about the nafs, they're speaking about that. But when we say nafs is just as a word, it means you. As a person, what you are. So what is Imam Abu Hanifa Ta'ala saying? That true fiqh. And faqaha, meaning seeing things as they are and understanding things as they are, is to know the nafs. Ma'rifatun nafs. Know you. If you can understand that, right? Know who you are. And then know ma'laha, what is for the nafs, meaning what is in your favor, what is good for you. And as a Muslim, ultimately we mean for that, by that obviously what is good for you in the Akhirah, right? What is good for you in terms of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we call fiqh, right? So this is halal, this is haram, this is faridah, this is not, this is malaha. Wa ma alayha. And also what is against. Or what goes, it's not in your favor, rather it is something that is, how do I word this properly? And it is something that is against you, meaning that which actually will harm you so like there are certain acts that will harm you there are certain characteristics and qualities they will also harm you so obviously if fiqh is ma'rifatun nafs it is to know the self what is for it and what is against it then that means you have to be honest right do you have to be honest or not uh, what is against any my own soul meaning what will harm me ultimately what is not working in my favor but rather it's working against me is very necessary to understand and know and without honesty you'll never know it without honesty you can never know it you'll just keep on living your life right and the worst type of life one can live is one is of delusion and the worst type of kibbut a person can have is to think that they're perfect and a khayrun min you understand that oh no I don't do those things I've never heard of these things before, and so they don't exist. Well, on the day of Qiyamah, that is not going to offer you any comfort. You may be able to comfort yourself and delude yourself here in this life, but in the day of Qiyamah, that's not going to do anything. That's why Umar said, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an yuhasabu. Take account of yourselves. Qabla an tuhasabu, excuse me. Take account of yourselves before Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in other words before you you are taken account of meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take account of you now the question is on the day of qiyamah will anything be hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will you be able to say I'm perfect I never did this I never thought this I never had this intention I never never imagined such a thing if, if you are like that mashallah you should be standing here and you should be telling us what the, you know mashallah how you achieved that position if it's not the case Right? Then everyone has to be worried about themselves in that respect. So you do what? You hasibu anfusakum, meaning that whatever questions may be brought before you by Allah on the day of Qiyamah, might as well bring those questions in front of you right now. Because it's going to happen. Right? Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean you can avoid it. Just like death, it's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to die and nobody will enjoy dying. But lakin kullu nafsin dhaiqatun maut. Every human soul will taste death. So in the same way, nobody wants to have someone take their account, right? What did you do in life? What were your motives in life? Because that question will be asked. As we know, one of the first people that will be thrown into Jahannam and Audi Billahi min Dalik on a day of Qiyamu will be a scholar, an alim, who spent his whole life in the service of Deen. And why will he be thrown to hell first before everybody else because of his motive? So your motives will be taken into account. What was your motive behind this? You wanted to be the scholar of the age, mashallah. You wanted people to say how knowledgeable you are. Well, people said it. The motive has been completed. So imagine this, how scary that is. Your motive is, it, it, you, whatever you wanted, it's done. People in the dunya called you a great man, called you a great scholar. You got what you wanted. Now there's nothing here for you in the akhirah. So motives will be asked. So therefore, when we take our account, we also have to ask those questions, right? 
What are the motives? What are our intentions? What do we want out of all of this? So this is a very harsh topic sometimes. So please forgive me if, if we are a little bit honest. Hmm? Because it's not supposed to be nice. It's not supposed to be anything but that. Because again, on the day of Qiyamah, unless you're one of those lucky people whose motives were so pure throughout their life that they'll be under the shade of the Arsh on the day of Qiyamah and they won't have to worry about any of those things. Right? May Allah make us amongst them. That literally, all they did was the dhikr of Allah. If you read their, their, their main, quali- the, what are the qualifications of those people who will be under the shade of the Arsh? It was the dhikr of Allah. Meaning their entire life, their motive was nothing but what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقَعُونَ وَعَجَنُوا بِهِمْ So then they don't have to ask, they don't have to be asked about what did you want in life. The answer is already there. The only thing we wanted in life was Allah. <laughs> Allah and His pleasure. So therefore, no, but if it's not the case, right, so we want to develop that, that habit. What, what are our, our internal any problems? And where and how do they exist? And how do we get rid of them? This is why this book is so, you, any, the utility of this book Subhanallah, it's, this is actually the book I'm using is, uh, is a c- condensed form of Ihya Ulum al If anyone knows, of course, this monumental work that Imam Ghazali had produced, he basically summarized all of his teachings as much as possible into 40 points. That's why it's called Al Arba'een. 40 points. 40, so at the beginning of the book, he starts with Ittiqad. Then he starts to talk about these qualities. First, he starts with the negative, which is Ajib. What he's saying is first you must remove the negative qualities, then they, the void is filled with positive qualities. Sometimes we find the opposite. In al hasanat yudhibin al sayyat. Sometimes good things remove ill things and bad things, evil things. But there are sometimes some qualities that their very presence will negate any good. If you see here what we've been doing so far, their very presence will negate any good. So hasid, as we said, the Prophet ﷺ said that if hasid is there in al hasad that they right? This jealousy will eat up your hasanat. So as we have one thing that will like salah, right? This is what this ayah refers to, in al hasanat yudhibin al sayyat. There are certain things that the goodness, the good that's inherent in it will remove the evil. In the same way, there are certain qualities that are so evil by nature that no matter what good is in you, that good is eaten up. Hasid being one of them. That's why this hasid is, some of them say this is from the umul amrad, the mother of all spiritual diseases, which is what? Kibr. As we mentioned some of this, right? Why are you jealous? Because you simply cannot accept the fact that someone that you believe is lower than you has been gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in more ways than you. So you're complaining directly to Allah of his taqdeer and saying that, you know, this is not fair. And you're also exhibiting an immense amount of pride thinking that I'm the one who deserves it, not this individual. Both of that is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no matter how good you are in the taste of Iblis doing ibadah for almost all of his existence, no matter how much good you have, that one quality is enough to literally kick you out for eternity. And the scary thing is, is that Iblis, again, he knows Allah, right? You understand my point? What is the greatest good any person can have is wahdaniyyah. It is to acknowledge the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet in Iblis, that was not enough. That kibr and pride and hasid was so bad, so evil, that even the recognition of Allah's wahdaniyyah did not help him, did it? It wasn't enough. So you have to be careful. We have to be very, very vigilant of ourselves and see what's going on. How are our hearts and minds? Where are they wandering? So to, to start with here, he, there's two brief qualities we'll try. and Not brief, but like, and there's two qualities. What's that? Um, oh, Um al Okay, excuse me, Um al Amrad. So today there is a discussion of Bukhul and Hubb al Mal and then Hubb al Jah. Bukhul is basically greediness, right? Uh, to an extent that you are what we call stingy. You've heard this word before, right? What is stinginess? That you are afraid to spend, you are afraid to give of any wealth that you may possess. The next part, of course, is hubb al-mal, the love of wealth. It's interesting here, he doesn't necessarily say hubb al-dunya, he just goes straight, right down to the, the, the core issue, which is the love of wealth, right? 
And then he goes to the next category, which is Hubbul Jah. In other of his works, for instance, Imam Ghazali, again, see, this is the thing, don't get mad at me. If you read the beginning, the Muqaddimah of Ihya Ulum al Deen, he basically is saying that the whole Muslim world in his time were a bunch of hypocrites. This is really what he says in, ult- <laughs> in, 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 in conclusion. This is what he says. People get mad at you, like, oh, you're always condemning. So look, this Imam Ghazali is basically the conclusion of his Muqaddimah. If you read it, Ihya Ulum al Deen, his conclusion is the Muslim world at that time is this basically a bunch of hypocrites. And that we have to revive Ihya, we have to revive our deen because now it has become nothing but a custom. So he mentioned this, he said that fiqh in the time of the Sahaba, the word and how it was understood was much different than the word fiqh as it's used today, which is hair splitting issues of aqsam al ma, like what kind of water there is. This is water that purifies and can, right? And, and is pure and can purify. He said all of that is not how the Sahaba did not understand fiqh in this manner. He spoke frankly, you understand? And maybe a lot of people got upset at him and they did. They actually burned his books in the beginning. And he said, fiqh in the time of the Sahaba was not all this hair spitting issues. Fiqh in the time of the Sahaba was khashyatullah. It was the fiqh of the akhirat. Like Imam Abu Hanifa said, ma'rifatun nafs. Ma'laha wa ma'aliha. It's to know you, yourself, and what is for you and what is against you. This is how the Sahaba understood it. So they didn't spend their time in all of these hair splitting issues. They rather spent their time on what this this is the whole point. Who am I as a person and how will I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is what Imam Ghazali says in the beginning of Ihya al If you were to read it, it's scathing. It's not nice. He's telling everybody off. He's like, look, we've got everything wrong. We've got to start from the very beginning now. If you read the, the, all these famous shiukh that people talk about, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, if you read his talks, it'll make you feel like you're the worst person in the world. <laughs> He'd basically tell you the same thing too. You're all hypocrites. You're all just showing off. Nobody here is sincere. You need to make tawbah. You need to make tawbah. Everyone needs to make tawbah. You would feel like, oh wow. This is why tazkiyat the nafs is not about pleasing our ego. Tazkiyat the nafs is about making us feel like, okay, yeah, we really have to do something. Like there's a fire behind you, right? Sorry to use this example, but it's kind of, I mean, you know, in the, in the German army in World War II, you know how officers used to get their soldiers to go forward? They'd put a grenade behind their foot. It's basically you don't have a choice. Either you're going to die there or you're going to die here, but you're going to do what you're told. Right? <laughs> There's a grenade under your foot, you're going to move. Right? You do what you're supposed to do. There's no time for this. Right? So this is what it is. When we talk about these things, it should be to motivate us. To say, look, it's done. We cannot be content anymore. It's time to change. Right? Time to change. So anyhow, Imam Ghazali Ta'ala says about Hubb al which is roughly the, na- the love of fame. He said that this is actually the last quality to leave the heart of man. And it still affects even the khawas, meaning the so-called the righteous or pious or religious people. That it is one of the last and final stages. That basically the, the, the love for notoriety and fame and name and to be seen is one of the most difficult diseases to detect and is the most difficult diseases to Remove Again, Imam Ghazali is being what? Honest. And no matter how much, right, if I have a crowd of how many people here, I don't know, how, I'm not very bad at head counts, maybe 200, 300, I don't know, right? And if I make myself known throughout the entire Chicago and the United States of America, I will still never be able to beat the fame of Imam Ghazali, right or wrong? Anyone know that? I'm sure people, and I hope, really, honestly, I hope that 100 years from now, no one will know my name. <laughs> <laughs> right? But Imam Ghazali Ta'ala's name will probably who knows how much longer people will be talking about him. Do you get my point? In comparison, even if we wanted name and fame right here, right now, how much will we be able to compete with these people? It won't happen. Uh, okay? Yet that same person is telling you that the removal of this disease. The love of fame and name is the last stage. And by the way, the reason, as we see Islamically, Imam Ghazali, ta'ala, or any of the imma, the only reason why Allah gave them popularity is because they never sought it. That the more sincere a person is, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them that popularity even though they don't want it. Even though they don't want it. This is the name of the game in Islam. 
Otherwise, if Allah gives you popularity while you're actually looking for it, this is a death for that person's soul. Death for them. This is the most dangerous thing you can do to anyone. This is why this microphone for a person like me, traditionally, in Islamic culture, this would never happen. Until you're about 60 or 70 years old, you don't get up and speak to anyone. Go look in any tradition of Muslims, so this is how it is. Students of knowledge, when you're done, you're you know, learning, you have to spend a couple more years in books. Then maybe you can get up and speak. Otherwise, no. Why? Why do they do that? Are they being harsh? It may be that even the student may have more knowledge than the teacher himself. That's fine. This is not what it's about. It's about tarbiyah. That the death of a young man is this. A microphone. It's the worst thing you can do to somebody's ego. Before they have developed themselves. You understand? Just put a microphone in front of them. Say, oh, mashallah, now he's called Shaykh. Subhanallah. Yes. No, I'm not telling you not to respect the younger ulama or the shiyukh. I mean, this is more for our own remi reminding ourselves that these things are dangerous. And one has to be very wary again of what your intention is. What is your goal? Where are you trying to get out of this? Where are you getting out of this? If someone's telling you to do this and they put their microphone in front of you, alhamdulillah, then you have no choice. You're compelled. You're mudtar. Right? Okay, I have to do it. Bismillah. Hopefully my intention is clean. But if you're promoting yourself, Right. This is the danger of the Islam we have fashioned in the United States of America. It's the MSA Islam, which means what? We like to promote, we like to have venues, we like to have huge names and people who will bring crowds and wow everybody and say, oh, what a nice speech. Now, many of us convince ourselves that this is all for the sake of Allah, which is fine. Maybe it is. Maybe your niyyah is pure. But you have to at least knit this much that there is a great danger in this type of, in this approach. A great danger and you have to remind yourselves of it continuously that we are not immune from these human weaknesses okay and you have to remind yourself all the time that this is something that is a da is dangerous for us remind yourself ikhlas 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 all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't just think that oh I'm doing the work of deen this is wonderful how many hits did we get how many people are right no don't do that remind yourselves Remind yourselves, because one person with ikhlas makes much more of a difference to humanity anyhow than an entire crowd of people. Ibrahim alayhi salam kana ummatan, right? He was as it by himself as one individual, an entire nation. And to this day again, you want name and fame? Every monotheistic culture that exists in the world will call themselves part of the Abrahamic faith. You can't beat that. And there was just one man, without a crowd, without a fanfare, without anyone to support him, really nothing. Just him and Allah. Khalilullah. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. That's all you need, right? What else do we need? Do we need anything else? So this goes to the whole reason why do we fall in love with all of these things? Why are we greedy? Why are we in love with wealth? Why do we even want fame? Really, at the end of the day, it is a very simple problem of how much tawheed we have in our hearts. In other words, the more tawakkul you have, the more you won't even bother with these things. You're greedy and stingy. Bukhul exists because you're afraid that if I spend my money, right, that I won't have any money. Which is a logical con conclusion because it's true. If I spend my money, that means what? I won't have any money. Sometimes we encourage people by saying that, you know, brother, if you give in the path of Allah, Allah will return that money in this world. Don't do that all the time. Because that's not always the case. Sometimes Allah does. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't. Because spending in the path of Allah is meant to be a test. It is meant to be a bank reserve in the akhirah. You understand? So if one poor fellow gives $10,000 in the path of Allah thinking that he was going to get what? And 100,000 in return And all of a sudden next year comes He doesn't have 100,000 And he say, you know, Sheikh, yesterday you told me <laughs> I was expecting $100,000 back In fact, that's why I gave What is the answer? The reason why Allah didn't give you $100,000 back Is because that's what you wanted He said, if you give 10,000 now I'm going to get 100,000 next year Wonderful, I'll give 10,000, no problem So that's why you're not getting it But at the same time that Your motive, you know, it's all about the motive Your motive should never be that if you lose money in this world, and you may lose money in this world, 
it is being reserved for you in the akhirah. You have to learn how to live with that concept. Otherwise, just do the bare minimum. Pay your zakah, give a little sadaqah to people in the community or your family members or whatever. Don't go out of the limb. Why? Because you're not ready for it mentally yet. The one who's ready for it mentally yet is the one who simply gives. This is how the Prophet ﷺ described this sadaqah. Gives with the right hand or excuse me, what the left hand is not even aware of. This is a, a, a type of expression which means that the person when they give their money, they don't even remember that they gave it. That's how much ikhlas they had at that time. That they don't even remember. Oh, really? You know, like, if, and it doesn't, now think about this. Doesn't have to be a lot of money if your left hand forgets, meaning you don't remember it. Probably if you spend $10,000 in the path of Allah, you probably remember that. <laughs> right? I'm sure you've got it written in your checkbook somewhere. It's like, I spent $10,000 in the path of Allah. But it may be that if some man, for instance, in the street came up to you one day and you weren't even paying attention and they asked you for $5 and you just gave it to them without even thinking about it. If he said, be that $5 or whatever. And then all of a sudden, the day of Qiyamah, you see this person come up and say, this $5 was given to me. You say, whoa, I didn't remember. You understand? I don't even remember that. that didn't, I didn't even think about it. And that person now... See, it's all about, again, you boil it down to one thing. It's not about what we do quantifiably. It's about what we do what? Right, it's the quality. So one small act of sincerity can make and break you. That's why Mu'adh bin Jabr anhu was told by the Prophet Akhlis, become sincere in what you do. And even a small amount of deeds will be enough for you. That's the whole bottom, that's the bottom line of everything, right? So when you're talking about loving things of, of this world like wealth, the only reason why you love wealth, you have to again identify what is your purpose. First of all, some ulama of, of, of lugha, you know, in the Arabic language they say mal, some. Not everyone agrees with this etymology or whatever, right? They don't, but mal, some say, comes from the fi'l or the verb mala yamilu which means to be inclined towards something. You understand? It means to be inclined towards something. So they're saying that mal therefore has a natural inclination in the hearts of every human being. Why? Because mal in this world is what you use to achieve your desires. Right or wrong? Whether you like it or not, this is a world of asbab. Things are not going to fall out of the sky for you. Wafi sama iris kukum wama tu adun, right? You can't, you can't take this. Ayah and say, oh yeah, look, all of our risk is in the sky. So I, I'm just going to wait for all of it to fall out. The house, the wife, the car, everything is just going to come out of the sky one day. I'm going to sit here. Mm. Well, why? Because fi sama iris kukum. Because it's in the sky. It's what Allah said. He said, this is a world of means. So in order to, to get anything in this world, you have to have mal. Matter of fact, even for your deen. Right? There are times when every man has to have a certain amount of wealth. At the very least, when it's time for a grown man to get married, for the ifa of the nafs to protect their soul and their heart from haram, then it becomes obligatory for them to have what? Wealth. They're going to have to have something. Unless you want to expect them to sleep in a like a sleep like in a in a tent somewhere in the woods or something like that. If you find a woman that's willing to agree with that, mashallah. <laughs> I don't know what kind of magic you worked hmm, to do to get her to agree to that, but that's not going to happen. So it means that automatically in our deen, there is actually an encouragement to do what? Well, you need something in this world. You need something in this world. Even to pay zakah, what do you have to have? Wealth. Right or wrong? Right. So there's nothing wrong in per se of wealth. It's a natural inclination and you need it even to do many of the aspects of our deen. It is a requirement. Okay. But what is wrong is when a person develops an attachment to it where that wealth becomes more important than everything else in life. And we don't have to talk about that because we see it in front of us all the time. Wealth becomes more important than relationships. Whether they are with your parents, with your uh, siblings, with your spouses, with the people outside, it doesn't matter. Wealth now becomes what? More important than the human relationships that you have. And we can't say that we haven't seen this before because this exists, right? It's there. Whether within the ummah or outside of the ummah, most of the fighting and dying and killing that goes on in the world today is all about what? 
wealth, status, all of these things. That's why in the Christian tradition they said that what? They, they, you know that in the Bible they said what? All right. The love of money is the root of all evil. There's a similar tradition. It's a hadith, although there's some da'af in the center, but there's a similar tradition in this also. Hubbu dunya ra'su kulli khati'ah. That the love of this world is the, literally the root, the ra's, the head. But it's the same thing, nafs is Like the root of all evil. So if you really take and examine the problems that we have in the world today, most of the time you will be able to sum it up in one thing. What is it? Hubbu ma, the love of wealth, the love of status, the love of power. If that wasn't there, you would not find people being so violent, would you? They wouldn't care. Everyone would be content, mashallah. What you have is what you have. What I have is what I have. We don't have any problems with that. I'm not, I'm not greedy for somebody else's wealth. They're not greedy for mine. I'm content. They're content. That sounds like utopia, doesn't it? Right? Think about it. If that's the way we were, where would the problems be? That's why the Prophet ﷺ even predicted for the Sahaba that today you're poor, but you're much better off than the, day, the days will come when you will become rich and Allah will give you of this dunya. Because, well, now there's no envy, there's no problems. People are not looking at each other and saying, if only I had what they have. Right? If only I had what he had. If only I can get what he has. People won't be doing that. So you're good now because your hearts are pure, you're happy. And everyone is content. The moment that comes that all the dunyas open up upon you is the moment that all your problems will start. So even there, the Prophet ﷺ is basically telling us all of the problems in this ummah too that began were because of one reason. What was it? Bastul dunya. That this world was opened up to us and wealth came to us. That's why in another hadith, Rasulullah ﷺ said, "Nikulni ummat in fitna, wa fitna al ummat al mal." With every nation there is a trial and a fitna. And indeed the trial and the, the, of this ummah is wealth. What is it? Wealth. So the Prophet doesn't lie, obviously. And I know that we can see this for ourselves. If you're not seeing it, it means you're not looking. Right? That the fitna of this ummah is nothing but wealth. If you learn how to rid yourself of this quality, then most of your problems in life will be solved. But it's easier said than done, right? The easiest way to rid yourself of this quality is to develop the quality of zuhd. Zuhd, they usually translate as abstention, right? But as I mentioned before, it's not quantifiable. You can get a person who wears rags and lives in a, in a, in a, in a, in a shanty town, right? In a very poor condition, but could have love of the, of the dunya in their heart. And you can have a man who drives a sports car, and has millions and billions of dollars and is a zahid fi dunya. How so? Because the word zuhd doesn't necessarily mean abstention, although that's what it's commonly thought of nowadays. Like in Surah Yusuf, you see its usage in lang just linguistically. When Yusuf السلام, was sold in the market as a slave, الزاهدين, that, that the people who sold him, the caravan that picked him up and sold him, they had no value for him. In other words, they didn't see in Yusuf anything worth of value. They just wanted to get rid of him. So the word zuhud actually means what? Not abstention. The word zuhud means to not have value for something. That you don't care about it. It doesn't really bother you. You understand? That's why I can. They didn't really think of him. And he's just a kid. What are we going to do with him? We need to get rid of him. Right? They didn't find any value in him. Like, what were you going to do with this small child? You understand? So when you look at the word linguistically, what does zuhud mean? It means it, you don't have value for something. So one has to train the heart that whether I have a little or a lot of this dunya, I cannot value it. I cannot let what the love of wealth drive me to the extent that it becomes more valuable me, to me than my human relations. My siblings, my parents, my spouse, all of these things, strangers even, that the dunya doesn't mean that much to me. If it's there, alhamdulillah. If Allah Ta'ala removes it, alhamdulillah. Even for my own personal sanity, I'm not going to lose sleep over what? Over the dunya. It's not going to happen. That's a true zahid. That if I have it, I'm okay. And if I don't have it also, 
I'm okay. This is the actual state of a zahid. Whether he has the money or not, doesn't matter. It means he has no value for it. Now, that's not something anybody else can judge. You can't go to the mufti or the sheikh and say, hey, do I value this dunya? How is he going to answer that question? Again, this is a question that you have to answer for what? For yourself. Now, the easiest way to, to understand that answer is to just first look at your reaction according to the sharia. In other words, if I'm unemployed, right, which happens in life, am I patient? Do I work hard to get out of that situation even if I have to stay within the halal, it means that it's going to be difficult for me, right? But I do that and I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a sign that alhamdulillah perhaps you do not value this world. But if for instance while I'm unemployed things get so intolerable for me that I say you know what I can't take this anymore. I need to make some money. And you turn towards the haram for instance. Lying, stealing, cheating, whatever it may be. And that's the first thing you say to God I can't do this anymore. Worst case scenario, that's the worst case scenario. Sometimes unfortunately people will do this not even because they're unemployed, because they just simply want the better things in this life. That's a sure sign that you're, knee, you're not even knee deep, you're neck deep in the love of the dunya. Because one thing is a man, may Allah protect all of us, is trying to the extent that they don't have anything, right? And they want what they want. Why do you think people rob, steal and cheat and do all these things? All this crime in Karachi and everything and everything is going on, right? All the things we complain about. Do people do this? for any other reason but the fact that they can't have anything in life and they want these things why do they do it? people don't just wake up in the morning and become criminals for, for fun right? it's all out of necessity even here in the west side or the south side or wherever you go in America people don't do this because it's fun why would you risk your life and go to jail in your 20s or even die before that because it's fun? people do it because they feel they need something and what they, they don't have the ability to get it so they're going to try and get it any way they can you understand? This is the result of constantly being told that your success and everything you need is in material wealth, right? You must have this. You must have that. You have to have brand name sneakers. You have to have brand name clothes. You have to have a nice car. You have to have a nice house. You have to have this, this, this. You have to, have to, have to, have to. After a while, the person says, man, I need all these things, but I can't get it. Why? Because the only opportunity I have is to work in McDonald's. And working in McDonald's will not get me those things. So what do I do? Well, there's quick and easy money right around the corner. This is all from hubb dunya hubb mal And it's not even our fault sometimes because this is how the society is geared towards that, right? Success is measurable. It's measured in how much you make. It's measured in how much taxes you can give the government. It's measured in how big your house is, how nice your car is. It's measurable. So when people are told it's all the time, Obviously, this is going to be ingrained in their very psyche and heart. So how do you measure it? It's the same way. Am I willing to do something that displeases Allah or hurts another person in humanity for the sake of this money, for the sake of this mal? If the answer is yes, then yes, that disease exists in your heart. It's there. If the answer is no, then no, I don't really care about it that much then I, I'm not willing to hurt other people. I'm not willing to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I do want something in this world. Then alhamdulillah, even if Allah gives you all those things in this life, you are not a person who loves the dunya. You're not a person who loves the dunya, even if you have it. So that's why we can't quantify, you can't tell like who does and does not love the dunya by looking at their car. That's unfair. Matter of fact, if you're doing that, actually you have to ask yourself the question, are, am I in love with the dunya? Why am I so concerned about this person's car? <laughs> right? Because if you really didn't care, you wouldn't notice it. It wouldn't matter if the man was driving up to the masjid in a Pinto or he was driving up to the masjid in a Porsche. Either way, you weren't going to look at him in that, right? You were like, oh man, look at the car he's got. You don't care because you're a Zahid. Doesn't matter to you. Look at this car that the brother's driving. MashaAllah. He says, if you're worrying about what other people are driving, possibly maybe even you can ask yourself that question. Maybe I have the problem. Maybe I'm the one who's in love with these things. Otherwise, we don't judge people. It's ajib that in the old books of fiqh, 
The ulama, when they spoke about iktifa in marriage, the compatibility in marriage, which is another subject for another time, they mentioned that to ask people about their occupation and what they do in life and how much money they have is the qualities of the ajim, the non-Arab. <laughs> the Arabs don't do that. Yet it is in that time. We're talking about, you know, a thousand years ago. It's not applicable now, okay? But the point they made is interesting. that The non-Arabs will ask you questions like that. What's your occupation? How much money do you have to bring to the table? Right? Where the Arabs didn't worry about that. SubhanAllah, at that time. Again, I'm just a thousand years ago, right? They asked about what? Usually what they concerned, what they were concerned about at that time, right after fresh, after the, the, the Prophet was coming, and there's, what family are you from, right? What kind of qualities do you have? Are you known for shuja'a, for bravery, for karam, to, to actually give your wealth? Are you known for these things? If the answer is yes, just think about what Abu Talib said when the Prophet ﷺ, when he married the Prophet Khadija anha. What did he say? Because at that time, many people don't know this, he, gave the khit, he, gave, he actually gave the, uh, yani, uh, he addressed everyone when, he, when they got married, and he said that although, because at that time the Prophet ﷺ was an orphan, Right? He didn't have anything. So Abu Talib said at that time that although he doesn't have wealth, but wealth comes and goes in life. Right? So even if you think that Fulan is educated in such a university, so they're going to have a bright future, there's no guarantee that that person is going to be employed. Right? That they're going to be making a six-digit salary for the rest of their life. You can't guarantee any of those things. And even if they are making a six-digit salary now, there's no guarantee that they won't go bankrupt the next day. So Abu Talib, mashallah, the Arab at that time, they were smart people. He said, wealth is not the reason why we should uh, base our relationships because wealth comes and goes. But if you're looking for a man of character and quality, then we have found no person better than, than Muhammad sallallahu Right? This is the bottom line. At the end of the day, wealth is not how you judge somebody. This is another way of how you know whether you love this dunya or not. Many of our shiyukh say that, you know what we do? We look at our own, the way we do things, right? If someone in the masjid comes who's poor, who doesn't have anything, how do we treat them? And if someone in our masjid comes who's wealthy, has a status, right, how do we treat them? There's another way you judge yourself. Is it because the reasoning behind your treatment is what? Just ask the question. It's again, a harsh question, but you have to ask it. Why am I treating the poor man as if he's insignificant and doesn't mean anything? And why am I treating the rich man as if he's the king of the world? It's only because of their wealth. Had the situation been reversed, that means the rich man now, you will disrespect him, you won't pay him any attention, and now the poor man has all the money, so you'll go to him. And the only re- this goes back to Hubba Jah, and these are the only reason why you love somebody because of their wealth. The bottom line called the Iyad, Rahim al made this very clear. The only reason why anyone respects somebody with wealth is because they expect some of that wealth, right or wrong? Because if that person doesn't give any of that wealth to anybody, we call them Bakhil, and that's a negative quality, right? We say, oh, nobody likes a person who's rich and doesn't give, right or wrong? So no, they have all this money, but they don't give anything. Do we like them? Or do we disrespect them? Which one is it? So the reality is you don't even really like that person. That's why sometimes, I'm not saying this to like absolve myself of any of these. Like, but sometimes when I see people who are that wealthy, we once visited this brother, I won't give names obviously, but in Cleveland, Ohio. Usually I don't pay attention, alhamdulillah, to these things and it doesn't really impress me. But I had, it, this guy's house was so ridiculously huge, it was, it was hard to ignore. Right? Sometimes you could ignore certain things like, okay, he has a nice house, nice car, mashallah, whatever. But this is just like, okay, this is a big house. I'll admit it. <laughs> this guy's got some money, mashallah. But then, I, you know, the way that I, I realized that, you know, the way he had to behave with even relatives. I don't envy his lifestyle at all. Because this man has to be suspicious of every single human being that he comes in contact with. Because he's going to feel that everyone here is, is just here for my money. Even sometimes it gets so bad that people even think the same about their spouses. That's why I met all of you, right? So they're just here for the money. The kids here too, they just want the money. The fulan just wants the money. 
My brother-in-law just wants the money. My brother just wants the money. This brother who's coming and asked me for the masjid too, he just wants the money. He says, I feel funny. But Jada, is a very bad situation to be in. You can't just live your life. And after all, what is money really for? Money is to be spent and to live your life. And if you can't even just live your life normally, then the money is no blessing. It is a curse, right? It's a curse. I can't just live my life normally. Everyone is focused on what, how much money I have. Nobody can even treat me as a human being normally. It's an ajeeb situation. So even if we look at it with an eye of reflection and ibra, we will not have any jealousy for people because of their wealth. Rather, we'll think that this is a great burden and trial. Right? For both the people who have it and the people who will want it. And that's why it's a fitna. Walikunli ummatin fitna. Wa fitnatun ummatin mal. Excuse me. That the fitna of this nation is wealth. So this disease is very serious, but of course, like I said, it's not always easy to get rid of. First, you have to judge, as I mentioned, through the sharia. That is the easiest way for every one of us to judge whether we have hubbud dunya or not. Not to go to some extremes, that's why I mentioned this. Don't try to practice the lifestyles of the shiuch that came before you. You won't be able to do it. And I mentioned the reason why. The other day too, one of my good friends happens to be Arab. He gave me a good a quote, you know, that basically, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانِ إِبْنُ بِعَتِهِ That mankind, they are the child, the children literally of their environment. Meaning the environment shapes your mentality. That's why I mentioned kids who grow up here poor, they're inevitably going to do things that they're not supposed to do to get wealth because the environment tells them that wealth is what makes you valuable. Am I lying? What are we told in this society? Wealth is what makes you what? Valuable as a human being. Literally. So that mentality creeps into us whether we like it or not. And that's why I mentioned the other day too the whole philosopher John Locke and all these people, fellow philosophers who developed part of what this country is today. That basically it's all about material and ex things you can experience, feel, see, and touch. Right? So because of that, whether we like it or not, again, we are affected by this environment and we all have this little bit of it in our hearts. We want what we want in this dunya. And if you were to try to live the austere life and the shiuch that came before us while you're living in this environment, I'm telling you by experience and also by what the shiuch say themselves, that this will break you. It will break you. You will eventually rebel. You will immediately go out and you will do whatever you want anyhow. Why? Because you've been doing this for so long and everyone around you is telling you that, hey, you need to have this, you need to have that, you want to have this, you want to have that. It's going to be very hard for you to survive. In New Jersey, just to give an example, there was a young man who went to Mauritania to study. And Mauritania, as you know, is a very hard place to, 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 to stay. And, and it, there's, not, there's nothing there. Material comforts are simply just not there. If you ask some of our ulama, young ulama that came back, what you have to do when you study in Mauritania, subhanAllah. I just ask them. It's not an easy place to be. So he got used to that. He was a new Muslim. He's full of josh. You know, mashallah, he has all this energy. Right? And he came back and he tried to replicate that lifestyle here. He got this little small little room and he rented out. He had no furniture. He just did all these things for about a year. Remember last time too, I mentioned a year because Abdullah ibn Umar anhum, I mentioned the same thing. If you do that for more than a year, it's a bid'ah. For one year, about only a year did this last. When unfortunately after that year, people saw him in nightclubs again. You see, nobody was there to balance him and tell him, hey look, this is not going to work. Your nafs is going to rebel against you and you're going to go somewhere that you've never imagined before. Because you've got to balance yourself. So again, take these things to understand very simply sharia, that's it. Am I hurting other human beings for the sake of money? If the answer is no, what do you say? Alhamdulillah. Am I violating the sharia? Am I going beyond the bounds of Allah? Tilka hadud Allah. Fala ta'aduha. If the answer is no, then say alhamdulillah. I would dare to say that if you say no to both of these questions, then make as much money as you want. MashaAllah. As long as you're fulfilling the obligations of sharia and you're not hurting anybody else, do it. MashaAllah. Kunu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu. Especially in this environment, because this is a game of like any, not a game, but this is like, you have to be smart. If you push yourself like this young man did, eventually you will end up somewhere where you never even imagined you would be before. You, it won't work. Trust us. There's a saying in Arabic that, Sal al-mujarrib wa la tas'al al-hakim. 
Ask the man who has experience, not necessarily the intelligent man. <laughs> theories are great, even in physics. You have many theories that in physics and mathematics it works, but it doesn't exist in the real world. Is that true? Right? So there's lots of things we can say that are masha, theoretically they're beautiful, but they just don't exist. So then ask the people who have experienced these things. <laughs> Go to the elders and ask them, hey, uh, what, what actually happens in the real world? Right? And not necessarily what you read in a book as a theory. You'll end up in a lot of trouble. The last quality which we, we are trying to, I wanted to cover a few so we can get this done as quickly as possible. We didn't get it done last time. Hubb al which is, again, the, the love of fame, right. the love of name. This goes back to another quality which he will mention later, which we will combine, which is ar which is show, right. to uh, ostentation, right. to show yourself off and to make people, like, draw people's attention towards oneself. Here he mentions it in a very simple way, which is also a very simple way of getting rid of this disease if it's there. Hubb al he said, is only there because you want other people to fulfill your desires. You understand? The reason why you want other people to like you is because you want other people of money and position and power to be able to fulfill what? Your desires. So in the old days, again, you look in Muslim history and in Muslim societies, why do you have all these poets around the kings? What was the point? Why were all these poets around the kings? They wanted the king to like him so that basically the king would just give them whatever they want. MashaAllah, Mutanabi and all the rest of them. Mutanabi with Sayful Dawla, all oh, read the stories about him. SubhanAllah, this guy just spent his whole time basically just, we have a word for it in English which I can't repeat. Right? Just, you're the greatest, you're the greatest, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. He even threatened him one time when he wasn't giving enough money that I'll go to the, your enemy and I'll start praising him. <laughs> you're being stingy I'm going to your enemy and I'm going to start praising him so you better start giving me more otherwise I'm going over there so the whole reason why you want people's attention is what? you want something from them that's why people complain today about our communities about all oh, you know like we don't spend on each other in one way it's actually a good it's a good thing you know why? because if I was foolish enough to think that by me coming here and impressing right everybody that I'm going to get something it doesn't happen and so on alhamdulillah <laughs> right I realized that actually you know I'm wasting my time <laughs> you know they're not going to get anything give me anything anyhow so you know what <laughs> it's, it's a waste of time it's a blessing from Allah that's why once when the you know some of the shiyukh came and complained that the rich people don't care anymore about right the madaris and the ulama and you know what his answer was see this is a khas it's alhamdulillah <laughs> alhamdulillah we are saved now from this fitna. We don't have to worry about it. We can just do our work without worrying about who is impressed by us or not. You know, we can just do it freely now. Don't worry about it. It's a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So nowadays, see the point is what? There's no king in this room who's going to be impressed by the turaqat you made and then therefore marries his daughter to you or something. It's, not, it's just alhamdulillah. It's not going to happen. Right? So we have it easy in that way. It's just not going to happen. Right? No, nobody's going to do that. So you might as well just give it up. Right? Just, mashallah. Your piety is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that can still, unfortunately, what we see often is people even want that notoriety and fame and name even if they don't get any benefit from it. And this is a serious psychological problem, actually. This means the person, as a man, please forgive me again, I have to speak frankly, is almost like behaving like a woman to a certain degree. You know, you just want attention for the, the amount of attention. There's nothing wrong, that's how women are, and that's a good quality within them. They need attention, they like attention. Okay? Men should be the opposite, should be. There's no reason why I need the attention of another grown man. Is there any reason why I need the attention of another grown man? Like, oh, he likes me, wonderful. What does that mean? What, what, what benefit am I going to get at the end of the day from that? Now, even my nafs is not going to get benefit from that. It's like, how does that make my nafs feel better? What this really means, unfortunately, and forgive me for bringing a little of a psychology in this, you need to go to Khalil Center, right? And then, we need to learn, sorry, is that sometimes people actually, unfortunately, when they're raised, they don't get, for instance, the love and nourishment that they need from certain people in their lives. The respect and the acceptance of certain people in their lives, like their fathers and the like. So later on, they need to seek that attention in somebody else. The father doesn't like what they're doing. What will a young man do? 
He needs that, right? A human being, psychologically, you need that. Right? So I'm going to go get that attention somewhere else. You understand my point? So a lot of times, if you're not getting attention for something of the dunya, it means you're getting the attention for something else and you have to identify it. What do I want? I want to, you know, do I need acceptance? Do I need people to, you know, give me, what they, you know, like, you know, like, like some kind of, you know, that you need to be told that what you're doing is okay, that we support you and all that, you need that, you know, then that is something also that is a very deep problem. And that's not something that's covered necessarily in the books of Tazkiyah. Because in those days, mashallah, of course, people would raise their children in such a way that the father would always be what? There for their children. It's not even the fault of some parents. It's just the nature of our lifestyle here. That unfortunately, we don't have time for our kids. And oftentimes, too, if our children make decisions that we don't like, we tend to also not like, be so supportive. Which is something we have to deal with in another time and another place. Right? Even if your children don't make decisions that you necessarily support or agree to, right? You still need to be there and to love them and to show them that kind of support. Otherwise, it will affect their mentality later on in life. They will need that attention from somewhere, right? That acceptance. Right? If we don't give it to them, the only reason why I mention these things is because if we don't give it to them, do you not think that there's a world out there that will give it to them? In negative ways? Come to us, we don't care what you are We'll embrace you And we'll take you in And we'll make you one of ours So the Muslim community, the masajid, our schools, everything We can no longer be people who take and, and reject people We have to be people who embrace Take everybody in with all their problems Bring them to us huh? Right? And we'll inshallah wa ta'ala try our best bi'ithnillah To solve these problems but either way, one has to ask the question, really, why am I trying to get somebody's attention? And at the end of the day, if you have tawakkul, and you know that Allah is the one who provides you with everything, then, the, then you would be very easy for you to say that, look, nobody controls my rizq. Nobody controls anything in my life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone controls all of these things. Whether this person accepts me, likes me, or brings me into their circle is irrelevant. If the whole world is against me even, as Ibn Abbas was told by the Prophet ﷺ, if the whole world is against you, that it will not change anything when it comes to two things, your risk and your safety. Right or wrong? It won't change anything. So it doesn't matter what people really think. But you just have to understand why you may be, um, again, it's someone who's, it's, we're not saying you because you. We're trying to speak generally for all of us. If we, or if you, or if somebody in the third person has this issue, right? Then they have to look inside and they have to identify why they want people's attention. If it's because they need something from somebody, then they have to understand Allah is the only one who provides. If it's because they need the attention and the love and all of that, then actually that's a much deeper problem than I can handle. <laughs> this is beyond my... <laughs> Right? That's something really you need to take advice from someone And you need to go to someone who is elder And knows these, uh, uh, about these things And to be able to deal with that right? But in general Keep the people out of your sight And don't seek fame We'll talk about that later in the year Because that is the next issue I meant when I said, when I said that we have a, an MSA style Islam in this country right? Where we like to promote and propagate everything And make speakers and popular names This is actually antithetical to Islamic culture In reality Shiyukh traditionally, ulama traditionally, and people who have piety and taqwa have always sought the opposite, which is what? Not to be seen, not to be known, not to be the one who everyone points their fingers to and says, MashaAllah, look at Fulan. This is one of the things Imam Ghazali mentions too, that the sign of the sincerity of a teacher or a shaykh is what? That if their student decides that they want to go to another shaykh and another teacher, he doesn't get upset. Right? If the student decides that I'm no longer, I, I, I want to go to Fulan, I need to go to Fulan, then he won't get upset. If he gets upset, it's a sign of what? He has to question his own niyyah. Like, what am I doing this for? For a crowd? For people to like me? To have a, lot, a huge band of followers that I can say, MashaAllah, they are my murids or whatever it is. Any shaykh will tell you I'm not interested in having murids. What really interests a true shaykh is that you have to become a wali of Allah. You understand? You have to become the wali of Allah. 
Even if at the end of the day the shaykh isn't, it doesn't become a wali of Allah, right? You have to become the wali of Allah. That's why you're there. This is the sincerity of our deen. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. So we will do that next time, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khairah for being patient and waiting so long. Uh, yeah. Oh. Sure. Yeah. One thing is that the only way you, that a person can spend money is if they, they themselves make the decision that they have to spend money in the path of Allah. And we can't really affect that. We can encourage people, but until they make that decision, it's not going to happen. At the same time, for our own benefit though, I understand what you're saying that many times we have like fundraisers and we see that, mashallah, many people in the community are doing more than well for themselves, right? But just to avoid su'udhan, like having suspicions about people or bad opinions about I would just tell myself and Allah knows if it's only true well he may be driving a nice car but I don't know how much in debt he is or <laughs> how much mortgage he has to pay or I don't really know you know like maybe he's so head and deep to live this lifestyle and like all the that he really doesn't have the money that he pretends he's having basically you know so why get mad now if he really does have the money and they're not giving the path of Allah really still then we can't get upset it's because it's a nafal right and also that it, it, it's just a matter of encouraging them and encouraging them until the point comes where they feel the necessity themselves, right? Otherwise, you really can't do much. What can you do? And the best thing to do to not get frustrated at anyone or anything is just to turn our sight away from them and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say that, you know, no matter how much we try, no matter how much you do for anybody, anywhere, it's that individual's choice at the end of the day, you know? But I understand the frustration. It is there. It is obvious that the community... I, I think even worse things than that. I think that if the community could lose 15-something million dollars in a scam, subhanAllah, <laughs> then they definitely have the money to spend on masajid and other things. You know? I mean, forgive me for saying it, but that's the truth, right? We have the money. We have the resources. But we just keep on encouraging until one day when the people find it important enough, they'll spend those resources and subhanAllah, hopefully all these masajid will never have to do another... Uh, any you know fundraising scheme again? Say I mean, seriously. May Allah open the hearts of some people in the communities to be able to be these kinds of recipients and, or the, the, the givers of khair to the point where hopefully no institution will ever have to do a fundraising again. I mean, literally, this is what we need. We should make du'a for it. Tonight is the perfect time to do it. Wallahu alam. Right, right. Having someone like a sports car or something which clearly has a high value seems kind of like an oxymoron. But sometimes I guess like, like, like uh, that's why people I guess have a higher affinity to someone who has wealth, who lives a simple life because he has the means to live in a very um, kill off the way, but he doesn't. Like if yeah. someone's on welfare and I just tell him he's promoting the good, people will never take him seriously because they'll say, you don't have the means to live otherwise anyway. What you just mentioned is for people who have to be a qudwa. You have to be an example for people in public. So obviously if you have a lot of money and you're living extravagantly, all the other people in the world will look at you and say, ah, you know, this guy, right? Do you understand my point? But for us, we're talking about the average person, right? So it could be that a person has nice things, but they don't really value them to that extent that it makes their whole life. Because we all like nice things. Let's just face it. You know, that doesn't mean we value it. It doesn't mean that if I don't have it, I'm going to get depressed or I'm going to go do something drastic to get it. But everyone likes, this is another thing the Muslims have to admit, that the pleasure in the world is there, even Imam Ghazali says that every pleasure in the world is there to remind you that there is pleasure in Jannah. 
and every pain in the world too is there to remind you that there is pain in the akhirah. So therefore as Muslims we do value the material world in that sense. It exists, it's there, it's real. So when you enjoy something, that's why the Prophet said, He said that indeed Allah is pleased when a man eats something and says Alhamdulillah. When they eat something that they enjoy and they say Alhamdulillah. Allah's pleasure. Like Allah's pleasure is there. So it's not that we're saying that the material world is completely valueless. Really what the Islam is saying, what Allah is saying is the reason why the dunya has no value is because it's what? Faniya, kullu man alayha fan. That is deceptive, it's gurur. It'll only be there for a few short seconds and then it'll disappear. That's why you shouldn't become attached to it because it's something that's faniya. You understand? It's something that doesn't last. Not that the pleasure isn't real or the pain isn't real. The pleasure and pain is there. You get what I'm trying to say? So for a person to just want to experience that, if it's halal, there's nothing wrong with that. We have to get that in our minds too. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And matter of fact, for some people, it's better for them. Because if they don't have it, they're going to be miserable and they're going to want it and then they're not going to be thankful to Allah. That's why the Prophet also said there's da'af in the center of this hadith, but the meaning is very sound. It's supported by other narrations too. And it's meaning that it's a narration of Ibn Bayhaqi, Yakad al Fakru an Yakuna Kufra. Then it may be that sometimes poverty leads to kufr. It may be that sometimes poverty leads to what? Kufr. Because if the person, right? If that desire for those experiences and that money makes them, gets them to the point where they're not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a fitna for them, right? You understand? That's why the, actually the shiuk say poverty is only suggested for those people who can handle it. Do you get my point? Poverty is only suggested for those people who can handle it. Meaning if you can truly honestly be grateful to Allah in the state of poverty, then yes, poverty is better for you. But if you're honest with yourself and you realize that, you know what, I won't be able to do this. That's why I mentioned these extremes. Like I, I won't. But to answer your question too, back to the, I remember once, very simply put, this impressed me greatly. A long time ago in the 90s, I went to Dubai and we met these guys because we were looking for, you know, tabarru and chanda for, for a school. And we met these guys who were obviously very rich, local, locals from Dubai, you know, Arab brothers, mashallah, and he had his kandura on, it was very nice. And, you know, obviously they have money. He spilled something on his kandura, on his dress, you know, like some food. And it, initially he was going to react. And his brother just said, Sabah, Sabah, Alhamdulillah. And immediately he just calmly said, Alhamdulillah. You know why that impressed me, a small act like that? Nice clothes, right? Fancy clothes. Any normal person, if they spilled something like that, would do what? Oh, man. All his brother had to do was say, well, sabr, sabr, alhamdulillah. And he just, you know, he's like, it's like that. You see, that small act right there means so much. It means that, yeah, these guys have money. They have nice clothes. But alhamdulillah, they don't value it. You see what I'm trying to say? It was so easy for him to just be told one time by his brother, sabr, alhamdulillah. And he said, alhamdulillah, okay. See, that's impressive. It's impressive. It impressed. I'll never forget it to this day. Ten years later, I'm still thinking about it. Like, subhanAllah, look at that. That's very, it's easier said than done, right? Because I know me, if I spill something on my clothes, you know, it's like, oh, you know, man, I'm trying to get it out. And I'm, you know, it's, I know that's the case. And I don't have nearly as much money as this guy does. But see the point? He's there. He's living the life. But he doesn't have value for it. As far as the only time what you're saying, when a person is living the life, but they should actually be humble, is only when they're a qudwa, you get my point? When they're, when they're an example for the public. Like Umar who only ate certain types of bread. Why? Because this is the only bread that the common Muslim can afford. He knows that people are looking at him. He's in public. He has to set an example. So he cannot, you know, go above the average man. But for other people who don't have that role, to have them to have wealth and to enjoy these things, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it doesn't have any value what? Here in their heart. Because you can get a poor man who values it too, right? And then unfortunately they will do whatever it takes to get it. Right or wrong? Mm-hmm. So, anyhow, we should stop here. Inshallah. If you have any questions, you can uh, leave them for tomorrow. Inshallah. <laughs>